This is section 9.1, Modeling with Differential Equations, Content Objective 3, which is to work with both the general and particular solutions to differential equations. When you are done, I would like you to be able to summarize what you've learned about solutions to differential equations when the differential equations possess a singularity or a point where the involved derivative fails to exist. For example 1, let's consider the differential equation y prime equals x times y. For part a, we want to show that every member of this family of functions will be a solution. So this requires us to do what we did in objective 1, which is we're going to replace the y prime and the y. To do that, we need to know what y is and we need to know what y prime is. y prime will be the derivative of this which moves through the constant, hits the exponential and leaves it alone, and then hits the exponent and takes its derivative. We need to now show that when we replace y prime with what y prime equals, that that is going to equal x times y replaced with what y equals. Well, looking here, because of the associative and commutative rules of multiplication, we know that that is indeed true. With part b now, we want to find the particular solution that satisfies this initial condition. So we already know that y equals c e to the x squared over 2 is the general family of solutions. So now we want to simply plug in the point to solve for c. So we're going to let the output, which is y, be 5 when the input is a 0. When we do that and simplify, we can see that c ends up equaling 5. So our particular solution is y equals 5 times e to the x squared over 2. With example 2, we are given the differential equation y prime equals negative y squared. And in part a, we want to know what you can say about the solution simply by looking at the equation. So to do that, we want to think about what dy dx equals. dy dx equals a negative y squared. That means the slope of the solution curves will always be the opposite of the y coordinate squared. That's going to tell us that the slope is always negative. It will also tell us that the slope is small or shallow near the x-axis and the slope is steep or large when we're far away from the x-axis. Next, in part b, we want to verify that all members of this family are solutions to the differential equation. So this is an objective one problem. And if you recall, what we did is we replaced the derivatives and the functions with what we thought they equaled. So that means we need to be able to replace y prime with the derivative of this y, and we need to replace y with this y. So in order to replace the derivative, I need to actually take the derivative, and it's easier to do if you rewrite it as a power. That way, oops, this is just plain y. That way the derivative will be that negative 1 times x plus c to the negative 2 times a 1. And that's the same as a negative 1 over x plus c squared. Now that we know what y prime is, we can plug it in and check to see whether it gives us a true statement or not. If I plug y and replace it with what y is, then hopefully the parentheses don't throw you off and you can see that indeed this is a true statement. If we look now at part c, it says we want to find the particular solution. So we have the general solution that was given to us in part b and now we want to pass through the point 0, 1. That will enable us to choose the one solution out of this family of curves that passes through this point. That gives us a y-coordinate that is 1, when the x-coordinate is 0. Solving for c, we will see that c equals 1, and we can write a particular solution that passes through the given point. If we now graph this, just to verify, we can see that this is a rational function that has a vertical asymptote at x equals 1. When I plug in 0, I get a 1 out and my horizontal asymptote, as x gets larger, is going to get closer and closer to 0. 
So we can see when we graph this function that the slope is always negative. We can also see that the slope is steep when we're far away from the x-axis and the slope is very shallow as we get closer and closer to the x-axis. Now there's a nuance here that we will develop in more detail when we get to example 5 that involves how we nail down this piece of the curve by using this one point but that we didn't necessarily mandate what had to happen over on this side. If we look at example 3, we have a function that satisfies a differential equation involving y. And the question is not for us to find the general family of solutions that work all the time, but to find specific solutions that have certain behaviors. So if we read parts a, b, and c, we can see that they're all asking about constant solutions, solutions that increase, or solutions that decrease. And all three of those give us information about the slope. If the function is a constant, then its derivative is going to be zero. If a function is increasing, then its derivative is going to be greater than zero. And similarly, if the function is decreasing, its derivative will be less than zero. So we can find all three of these by simply factoring this dy dt and doing a sign chart analysis. So to factor this, I can see that a y squared can come out of all three terms. And then I can look at the trinomial that's left and factor it again. And we'll get a y minus a 5 and a y plus minus, excuse me, a 1. So if I now do a sign chart analysis on that dy dt, we can see that we have zeros at 0 and at 1 and at 5. And if I test numbers smaller than 0, say negative 1, this will be positive, this will be negative, and this will be negative. Multiply them all together, I end up with a positive. If I choose something between 0 and 1, say a half, this will be positive, this will be negative, and this will also be negative. So we are still positive because that 0 was a double root. So we just bounced off and continued in the positive direction. Between 1 and 5, say at 2, we can see that y2 would be positive, this will be negative, and this will be positive. So we end up with a negative. And after 5, all 3 will be positive. So the constant solutions will occur when y equals 0, y equals 1, and y equals 5. If I were to plug any of these three in, we would get 0 equals 0. So these all three would be solutions to the equation. For this one, it says for what values of y is y increasing. So that's going to occur whenever y is less than 1 or when y is greater than 5. If we look at part c, we can see that y decreases when y is between 1 and 5. And just like we did in section 4.3, we want to include those zeros because y will grow until and including 1, and then it will grow from 5 on. With example 4, we are given a pretty complicated differential equation involving t's and y's. And rather than finding out when it is increasing or decreasing, or finding an actual solution, or testing whether a solution works or not, we are given graphs. And we are asked to determine why these graphs can't be solutions. So the first thing I would do is I would look for a solution or a behavior for slope and see if that happens on the graphs. So I can see that the slope will equal 0 when this factor right here is 0, because e to the t will never equal 0. But this one will equal 0 when y is 1. That means graphically, if I come and look at 1, I should see a horizontal tangent. And I see one here, but I don't see one here. So this messes it up. Also here, I can see a 1 and I don't have a horizontal tangent. So I know that just from that alone, I'm going to have issues. The other thing that might come into play is that this is always a positive number, and this is also always a positive number. So that means the slope always needs to be positive. Well, looking at this graph, the slope is always positive. It just didn't flatten out like it was supposed to at 1. And on this one, we're positive followed by negative slopes. So this one screws up in two ways, whereas this one only screws up in one. 
With example 5, we are going to encounter a nuance that has been showing up lately on the AP exam. And the reason it's showing up is it's a tough application of this whole concept of a particular solution versus a general solution. We learned at the beginning of this section that a particular solution is a single curve that comes out of that entire family of parallel curves and that once we nail down a solution out of the family using that initial condition we should only get one solution not multiple solutions and yet when we look at f and g they're both obviously different functions because this one is 1 over x the entire time whereas this one has two different branches that behave differently so I'm going to show that these are both solutions to the initial initial value problem and then we're going to talk about why that is not a contradiction. So first we need to take the derivative of f and take the derivative of g and show that they when plugged into this will give us a true statement and that they both satisfy this initial condition. To do that I'm going to rewrite both of them involving powers of x so that it's easier to take the derivative. Now if I look here I can see that f prime will be negative 1 times x to the negative 2, which if we simplify that is 1 over x squared. Notice that the derivative equals what it's supposed to, so that one checks for the solution to the differential equation. Now let's test the output. If I plug 2 into the original function, then I would get a 1 over 2, which is a half. So that as well works, and we satisfy the differential equation and the initial condition. If we look at g now, g, remember, is a piecewise function, so I have to differentiate each piece separately. And I'll get a negative 1, x to the negative 2, and I'll get the same thing down at the bottom. So notice that both branches of this, whether we had the piecewise or not, would give us the same derivative. So again, we will satisfy that the derivative equals that negative 1 over x squared. So that one works for the differential equation. And if I check the initial condition, plugging 2 into the graph means that I would go to the branch that is greater than 0 and plug 2 in. What do you know? I get a half. So here we have two different solutions that are both solutions to the initial value problem. Somehow that is a contradiction, but we need to show that it isn't. So let's think graphically about these two functions. We have one function that is 1 over x, and it passes through the point 1, 1 half, or excuse me, 2, 1 half. And then we have the other function, g, which matches up exactly on the right side, and on the left, it moves that whole picture up 1. So what we see here, and this is the nuance that you need to know, is that if the original derivative has an issue, if it has a singularity or a hole in it or an asymptote or any sort of discontinuity, then nailing down a point only nails down what's on that side. So here we can see that this derivative has an issue at 0. We've got a problem at 0. So we're going to have to jump tracks. This y of 2 equals 1 half is nailing down one point out of the family of curves that would be over here. So we get this one branch to the right of the singularity. When we're on the left side, we could have anything we wanted because nothing on this side was nailed down. Therefore, when we nail down and use an initial value problem on a differential equation that has a singularity, then we're only nailing down the portion of the solution that passes through that point. And once we hit the singularity, we can jump tracks and go to any of these branches that we want.